All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Structure for Learning. And in this video, we're going to do an introduction to the angle of twist. And what we're going to do is describe the angle of twist, what it is, and then explain where the angle of twist formula comes from and go through a description of how you might use the variations of the angle of twist formula based on loading and geometry. So let's get to it. The angle of twist is a deformation, specifically the angle of rotation associated with torsion or a twisting moment. All right, so let's look at deformation before and after. I've got this rod here with this rectangle initially drawn to it. It's unloaded. Then I apply an external torque, and I notice that this rectangle changes angle, and that angle implies shear strain. When we notice these angle changes, we associated them with shear strain. Previously, we probably went down this path. We applied Hooke's law and calculated the shear stress, this torsion formula. This time, what we want to do is instead of going down the path of stress, we're interested in knowing the angle of rotation at a specific location along the length, which is the angle of twist. And we're going to use the Greek letter phi to represent the angle of twist. All right, let's see how we actually come up with a number for this angle of twist. Let's consider a rod that's fixed on one end. And right now, it's not loaded at all. It's got a center, a centroidal axis, if you will, right here. And if I look at a undeformed line from the end of the fixed rod here, We'll say it goes from here all the way from the fixed end to the front here, radius from the center to that edge or the outer surface of the cross section. We'll call this rho. And this rod has a length L like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply an external torque twisting moment to the end here, that torsion causes the end of the rod to rotate. And if we call this like point A at the fixed end of the rod, we'll call this point B. Here is point C like this. And then when I apply that external torque, point B is going to rotate down to here. We'll call that B prime. It rotates this distance. That radial arm will rotate to here. And point A will stay where it's at, but this longitudinal line AB will deform like this. All right. This is where this angle change is happening. You know, if I was looking at that rectangular block before and after, what I would be seeing is this block on one edge. This angle right here is the shear strain. And this angle here, this is this angle of rotation or twist at the end of the rod. And we're going to call that angle phi. And for small deformations, we can relate the angle of twist to the shear strain by looking at the length of segment BB prime. The length of BB prime is equal to gamma times L, which is equal to phi times rho. Yes. Now, when I focus on just this angle of twist, I can solve for phi. If I assume linear elastic behavior, then Hooke's law applies. And the Hooke's law for shear stress is... And if I substitute for the shear strain, and I know that my shear stress due to torsion is... And I see that the radii cancel out. My formula for the angle of twist, when I have a constant cross-section, a constant internal torque, and you know uniform material properties, is this phi equals TL over GJ. And I, what I've done here is relate the angle of twist directly to the internal torque. Another thing you might want to be aware of is that GJ here, G is the shear modulus of elasticity, J is the polar moment of inertia, and together they they make what's called torsional rigidity or torsional stiffness. This formulation for angle of twist is good for constant cross sections and constant internal torque. And when you have a variable like a, a tapered cross section or a distributed load, then we're going to want to use an integral formulation like this. Now, the process of using this angle of twist formulation is, in fact, very similar to axial deformation. All right, so you can see the analogy between the axial deformation and the angle of twist. We've got internal load to internal load, length to length, modulus to modulus, 
area to polar moment of inertia. And you can also see the same thing with the integral formulation when you have varying cross-sectional area or loading or internal loading. The process for solving problems with angle of twist are, is also very similar to axial deformation. And so if you feel good with axial deformation, you're going to be good with angle of twist. So let's take a popular case, a rod that will have different constant cross-sections and with concentrated torques. And it might look something like this. So I've got like three shafts kind of welded together, if you will. Maybe I have a concentrated torque here and here and here. What you want to do is identify discontinuities and cuts. And these discontinuities and cuts, at least for this case, are concentrated torques and sudden changes in geometry. And when I say sudden, I'm, th I'm thinking like steps, right? So like I go from like 10 millimeter diameter, all of a sudden I jump to 20 millimeters in diameter. Like I have this concentrated torque here, so I'll call that A. I have another concentrated torque here, so I'll call that B. That's a discontinuity. I have this sudden jump in the cross-sectional area here. I'll call that point C. And then here I have another sudden jump, a decreasing area. I'll call this point D. And then here I have a concentrated torque. The other discontinuity location locations that you have to be aware of, the beginnings and ends of distributed loads. But we don't have any here, so we'll just ignore that for now. You know, I've identified my discontinuities here. In this case, I've got one, two, three, four, five discontinuities. I'll circle them. And what I want to do is cut between discontinuities. So here, I'm going to definitely make a cut here. And that cut indicates that between A and B, that segment has the same internal torque wherever I cut. And same with B, C, C, D and DE. And I'll call these cut 1, cut 2, 3, and 4. A lot of times I want to find the angle of twist of end A with respect to end E. And I can use my disc my discontinuities, identifying these discontinuities helps me identify what segments I need to pay attention to. So in this case, this angle of twist of A with respect to end E would be the angle of twist of segment AB or A with respect to B plus the angle of twist of BC plus the angle of twist of CD plus the angle of twist of DE. So all my segments are defined by the discontinuities. I could, you know, I can keep them in letters. If I like using indices, I can number them by cuts. So I could be like phi1 plus phi2 plus phi3 plus phi4, like that, yeah? And then I could say, well, you know what? This, this angle of twist is a summation from i equals 1 to n, n being the number of cuts, phi i, like this. And each of these portions, I could say, are simply from i equals 1 to n, like this. It'd be the internal torque in cut 1 times the length of segment 1, and that segment 1 would be here. This would be, if you will, L1. This would be L2. This would be L3. And this would be L4, like that. And then I have divided by divided by the modulus of elasticity of each segment. So even if they were all different materials, and I'd have the polar moment of inertia associated with each cross-section for each segment. And that, in a nutshell, is how I would solve for the angle of twist. You know, what we did here was we established kind of this overall equation based on discontinuities. This is the relationship we would use when we have different constant cross sections in constant internal torque. So now we'll look at the other case. We'll just call that case two. There's going to be a continuously changing internal torque and or a changing, a continuously changing cross-sectional area. The, the changing internal torque would typically be due to a distributed loading, and the cr changing cross-sectional area might be something like a tapered rod. Here's one possible situation. This rod here that has a tapered section and then a constant cross-sectional area portion. Let's go ahead and put some loading on it. I've got this distributed torque here on this region. The intensity of this distributed torque varies like this. No big deal. It could be linear, constant, uniform. I'll have a concentrated torque at this end. And the process is really similar. In fact, I'm going to follow the same process as I did before. 
Let's see, I look for concentrated torques. I've got one here. Do I have any sudden changes in geometry? Well, you know, I've got a section that's going from tapered to constant. So that is an actual shift in geometry here that we need to worry about. It's also the beginning of a distributed load, as is here is the end of a distributed load. So what I would have are three discontinuities that I need to be aware of. I'll label these by letters A, B, and C, and I know that I'm going to be making two cuts. I'm going to be making a cut here and a cut here. I'll label these cut one and cut two. And I can establish an overarching relationship for the angle of twist. I want to find the angle of twist of end A with respect to C and this overarching relationship right here, the angle of twist of A with respect to B plus the angle of twist of B with respect to C. So based on my discontinuities, I was able to identify the segments that I want to break it up into. Now, whenever I have either a, a varying area or a distributed load, I want to do one more thing. I want to establish a coordinate system for each cut. And that means identifying an origin. And that origin, you want to put at a discontinuity. And then you want to identify the range of the coordinate system. So what does that look like? It looks like this. Okay, so here's cut one. I'd like to go left to right. I'm going to choose my discontinuity at A. So this will be zero for my first coordinate system for cut one. And I'm going to go left to right. Boom. I'll call that my coordinate system X1. This is the length of AB. The range of X1 is from zero to the length of that segment AB. Cut two. Let's say I'll choose the discontinuity at B as my origin. And I'll say, here is x2 and the range for x2 is from b to c from discontinuity to discontinuity and it would go from 0 to lbc so those i've identified my origin and the coordinate system for each cut and that is going to help me to determine the internal loading as a function of each coordinate system because in my overarching equation for the angle of twist write this in terms of cuts that could be phi 1 plus phi 2. The angle of twist for cut 1 is going to be the integral formulation because I have a varying area and so my formulation will, might look like this. It'll be and the range for x1 is from 0 to l a b like this. Yes. And then for cut 2 I will have and this is how I would set up my angle of twist formulation for varying area and varying internal torque, which is typically associated with tapered beams and distributed loads. All right, hopefully this was a useful introduction. I don't expect you to understand everything all at once because you know why? The only way you're going to get better at this and more familiar is if you practice. All right, take it easy. Structure free.